This just in. Last week I had crab for dinner. Won't say what kind exactly, but it was really yummy. And yesterday I found out there are these crabs. Special crabs that, to put it mildly, no one likes. And when I just said no one likes them, that was a real understatement. The thing is, from 2021 to 2023, Washington State and its partners caught and killed over 400,000 European green crabs. Yeah, they're green. Green crabs are the ones people hate. In British Columbia, in Barkley Sound, people catch hundreds of green crabs a day. To eat? No. Over in Australia, one trap catches about 400 of them. In 2023 in Denmark, they caught and killed at least 46 tons of crabs. Nobody bothers counting the number of crabs anymore, and this aggressive crab hunting is happening right now, all over the planet. But why are people so determined to kill these animals? And why do governments even pay for it? I won't get into that without a sip of coffee. And as usual, an unobtrusive reminder for those who forget to hit the like button at the end of the video to remember to do so. And for those who don't, this message isn't for you. So who are these European green crabs? They've been in North America for over 200 years and probably arrived in the United States from European ships, but that's not really important because these days this species has spread, well, basically everywhere, except Antarctica. And green crabs are causing chaos everywhere. One adult green crab can eat up to 40 young clams in a single day. The more crabs there are in the area, the worse the situation gets. In Maine, for example, green crabs consumed over 99% of young clams. According to scientists, green crabs cost the fishing industry nearly $19 million a year just on the east coast of the USA. The green crab threatens an $890 million industry in the state of Maine. And that's just one state. What happens to the place where the green crabs end up? Nothing good. So let's say we have some abstract territory and here come, well, a couple of crabs. And they start multiplying at a frightening speed. After a short time, quite short, people catch 30,000 crabs at this spot. Just a year later, the catch will be over 200,000 crabs. Can you believe the speed? Naturally, such a number of animals must somehow live and green crabs literally uproot local vegetation. This includes vital habitat for other organisms like eelgrass and salt marsh grass. Crabs destroy it unintentionally, but they behave very aggressively while digging burrows and the plants just happen to be an accidental victim. Those seaweed patches protect against coastal erosion, act as a filter for runoff and excess nutrients, and also produce food and oxygen, preserving greenhouse gases. But the crabs don't seem to care. They've already ruined everything. Soon after the vegetation disappears, local creatures start vanishing too. Soft-shelled clams, bay scallops, and native crab species. Because green crabs are the top predators in the intertidal food web, wherever the species appears, the food chain structure completely changes. The equilibrium disappears, and along with it, eventually, most animals. Only consequences remain, erosion, and the crabs themselves. And this situation is happening everywhere in the world. Although I couldn't find the total yearly damage across all countries, it's no surprise that European green crabs are seen as one of the most aggressive invasive species on the planet. Fighting invasive species often comes with a price tag for governments. In various parts of the U.S., trapping programs were initiated as far back as the late 20th century with rewards promised for catching crabs. And they still pay money. For example, on the east coast of the USA, hunters are promised 40 cents for one pound of green crabs. Not a lot, of course, but there are enough crabs to make money catching them. In Washington state, the rates are better. They offer $5 for every green crab caught. There were also various volunteer efforts to catch and eliminate them, both organized and spontaneous. Apart from volunteers and those looking to make some money, there are other methods of fighting crabs. After all, it's the 21st century, which means it's the era of technology. Well, they don't use robots against crabs yet, but they do use similar devices to fight invasive carp. Essentially, it's a special boat with giant nets that look like wings, shocking the fish. After high doses of electricity, the fish die, float to the surface, and you can wipe out up to 500 of them in just five minutes. And I'm certainly not a technical expert, but we can surely come up with something similar, just for green crabs. Besides, artificial intelligence has already been set up against crabs. The technology is called Musebox, and it's used against blue crabs in Italy. But if you tweak the settings a bit, how does it work? 
Musebox can keep scanning water nonstop, finding invasive crabs and letting authorities know they're around. It's a digital savior that never gets tired, never blinks, and can notice even the sneakiest crabs creeping along the bottom. And its built-in AI helps tell crab species apart, so we don't send the Coast Guard scrambling for just some harmless local crab. There are even more old-school ways. For several years now, scientists have been training dogs to sniff out dangerous invasive species in lakes, usually talking about the same carp. But if dogs can smell a harmful creature without seeing it, why not tune them into crabs? Dogs work even better than laboratory instruments. Their sense of smell is that sensitive. If you place a two-pound carp in 530,000 gallons of water, a dog will know it's there. This is totally awesome because invasive species should be spotted as soon as possible and steps taken before it's too late to do anything at all. There's only one problem. Crabs live in the sea, unlike carp, and it's unclear if a dog's sense of smell will work as effectively with them. Another way to influence crabs, so to speak, from within is to introduce other predatory species into the waters. Leopard sharks and sculpin would be good choices, and on land, herons and small mammals like otters and raccoons could help. These predators could limit the green crab's habitat range simply by eating them, a lot, and with pleasure. But when it comes to European green crabs, you have to be really careful. You can't just go and exterminate all of them even if you really feel like it. There's one very tragic example. Once a large population of green crabs settled in a sleepy little sea drift lagoon north of San Francisco, people swam while crabs crawled on their feet and legs. In short, there were a lot of crabs. Everyone already knew that invasive animals posed a threat to local species, which would have to fight for survival. Pretty soon, the number of green crabs in sea drift approached 90,000 individuals. Something needed to be done about this, and urgently. In 2014, a team of California ecologists removed most of the large adult crabs from the lagoon and the population suddenly surged. There were about 300,000 crabs in the lagoon. That's some crab math for you. The good news is that this whole situation with the sudden population explosion showed people how not to exterminate crabs. Catching as many of them as possible is a really bad idea. Now the strategy is to maintain a small enough population. That way, crabs won't harm local species, but there will still be plenty of them so there won't be a population explosion next year. Eventually, they managed to reduce the population of green crabs in sea drift to 40,000 crabs, and overall, that's a scenario that everyone's happy with. But the question remains, why does the number of crabs increase when there are less of them? If 90% of adult crabs were removed, shouldn't the opposite have happened? Actually, specialists compare the challenge of halting the invasion of green crabs to trying to squeeze toothpaste back into the tube. It's complex, pointless, and largely impractical. It turns out adult crabs eat their young, keeping the population under control. And at the moment, when there were almost no adult crabs left, numerous young simply went unchecked and bred uncontrollably to 300,000. It took researchers some time to figure all this out. Luckily, nearby, in a place where crabs weren't caught, there was no such population explosion, so it was the fishing that was to blame. So we get fewer adults, but more young ones surviving. By the way, it's not just because the young stopped getting eaten. Competition for resources also disappeared, which means the young matured faster and were more successful in reaching adulthood. This kind of effect is called the Hydra effect. Cut off one head and two grow back in its place. Even if you're not really into Greek mythology, you've probably seen this image in pop culture. But the ability of a population to increase in size when someone tries to reduce it isn't the only reason why green crabs are called invincible. Modern crabs are much more advanced compared to their ancestors who were accidentally brought wherever. They stubbornly interbred to create a super predator resistant to cold water. Researchers don't call invasive crabs in Canada, for example, the Schwarzenegger of their species for nothing. Green crabs have really leveled up. They not only handle cold water well now, but they've also developed resistance to low oxygen levels and changes in salinity. Where their ancestors felt uncomfortable, today's green crabs are right at home. Recently, researchers found that green crabs can also absorb nutrients through their gills. This makes them a kind of superhero in the marine world. Or super villains, depending on how you look at it. Imagine if you could eat while you breathe. If you think about it, it'd save a heck of a lot of time. Also, green crabs can learn and improve their hunting skills while foraging. They're not just fast, but they can also open shells in more ways than other crabs. Green crab legs are great for running in mud, but the coolest thing is their shell. 
For any crab, molting is a super dangerous time because until the hard shell forms, the crab is really easy to eat. But for green crabs, the hard shell forms way faster than for many other species, another bonus to their invulnerability. That's why we have to do something about the crabs before they cause a crabocalypse. Scientists believe that if green crabs were the size of a human, they would be the only species left on planet Earth. Think about it. They live in both warm and cold water, can survive out of water for a while, are aggressive and practice cannibalism, destroying any species they share space with, including each other. Basically, they're perfect invasive conquerors. Oh, and they reproduce at a terrifying speed. Female green crabs can lay over 175,000 eggs in their lifetime, allowing the species to quickly take over their habitats. Not to mention efforts by humans to eradicate the crabs, which lead to the opposite effect. Over the past decades, green crabs have spread rapidly throughout the ocean, and the situation could only get worse from here. So much so that we risk losing, well, a bunch of other species. Mollusks and lobsters are just the first victims that'll find themselves in the way of crabs towards world domination. It's weird that they haven't made a disaster movie about this yet. But for now, you owe me a like. See you later.